When I say women's rights, what do you think about? It probably depends on where you live, your income level, and your political affiliation. A few weeks ago, I set out to do a story that would be both positive and about women. I walked into a minefield, which I think is something that journalists and aspiring journalists like me have to do from time to time. Report a story even when it means walking a fine line. I am a white man, middle class-ish, Christian, reporting on women and women's rights. The story idea was about alcohol, violence, and women. What do you think would have happened if I had brought up abortion? I would have had to discuss Roe v. Wade, medical procedures, the pill, Bible verses, temperance, and the vote would have been, if I can say it, suppressed. It would have distracted from the whole episode. It just didn't fit the story. I had to make an editorial decision. These decisions happen all the time. Should it stay or should it go? In an era when so many people are angry at the media, it's helpful to discuss the process. Let's pull back the curtain and see how stories get made. You're listening to the show that uses journalistic tools to look inside the Christian church. We press pause on the culture wars to explore how we got here and how we can do better. I'm Chris Steren, and this is Truce. One of the Christian organizations I support is Christianity Today. They produce a really good magazine, a website which frequently scoops me, and podcasts. I had the pleasure of speaking with Richard Clark. Yes, I am Richard Clark. I am branded content and partnerships manager for Christianity Today. And I also help produce our podcasts. Christianity Today has been around since 1956 and was founded by Billy Graham, maybe the most famous evangelist in modern history. If you've heard of one evangelist, really, it was probably him. One of the newest ways Christianity Today is reaching out to the world is through their podcast, Living and Effective, which partnered with the Christian Standard Bible. It's hosted by Richard. Uh, I also host a podcast called No Chill Enneagram on the side, sort of in my spare time, which is sort of a dumb, silly uh, passion project of mine. I think we all need dumb, silly passion projects. A hundred percent we do. Yeah. Keeps you fresh. I wanted to talk to Richard because living and effective is a lot like truce with edits, sound and interviews, but its approach is different than my own, which I really appreciate. So I wanted to find out why he approaches the material the way he does. Well, but Christianity is such a, a big umbrella. Um, and Christianity today does a, a remarkable thing. They walk such a, a fine line between different opinions, you know, because Christianity covers, you know, Reformed churches, Pentecostal churches. How do you navigate that uh, when you're trying to produce a story? Well, let me think how I want to answer that. He said a good place to start as a reporter was by examining your own bias. I sort of like to lean into other viewpoints in a, in a more active way. I am a Reformed Southern Baptist. That's a very particular segment of Christianity. It comes with a lot of inherent sort of assumptions and and even weaknesses. And one of the things that I love about Christianity today is it allows me to sort of have an outside perspective on those things and to learn from other uh, other groups of people, other denominations, other segments of Christianity, and to sort of go, oh, well, there's there's something we can learn from there, too. So step number one is turn your bias off. This is not easy to do, by the way, especially in Christian circles, because our faith is so precious to us that if someone disagrees with it, even on a minor doctrinal issue, it can seem very personal. You know, I just find it really interesting. I find all of those segments relatively interesting sort of on their own so let's say that richard is producing a story about willow creek 
Willow Creek, for those who don't know, is a mega church with satellite churches all around Chicago. They've done a ton of positive stuff. They write curriculum, put out Bible studies. Lee Strobel, the author of the Case for Christ book series, used to be involved. We're talking about books, a major leadership conference. I interned at a church in college, and at every staff meeting, it was Willow Creek this, Willow Creek that. It's very influential with modern Protestant churches. We could stop the story there, or we could talk about the reality that their lead pastor, Bill Hybels, was involved in some sexual misconduct for a while. See how complicated this gets? It'd be easy for a reporter like me or Richard to write an article or make a podcast that smears everything that Willow Creek has ever done, that their entire denomination has ever done. That would be terrible, because they've contributed a lot to positive things in Christianity. If we as reporters can leave our bias at the door, we gain some very helpful perspective. Um, and so it's it's not hard for me to sort of report on, say, you know, like whatever might happen at Willow Creek and then not and not make it a biased thing from my perspective right like that never happens here or something like it's pretty clear <laughs> those those things happen across the board and i think when you work at ct long enough you sort of have an understanding that you have an understanding of two things one is the ways all of these denominations are so dramatically different but even more you start to recognize the ways they're all similar but, i mean are there ever like movements that you say well, we're just not going to cover this well, that's not always my decision. That's kind of a that's kind of above my pay grade a lot of times. But I don't I don't know if that's necessarily the decision that would be made. I think the decision that uh, Christianity Today would make, um, certainly when I was an editor for the magazine itself, you know, a lot of the conversation just had to do with how newsworthy something was. That may seem obvious, but it's a great question to ask. Do people need to know about every click or niche, every misbehavior, every scriptural debate? Maybe not. That's where CT has like had to make decisions around politics, around sort of more progressive uh, sides of things. I think when you go into those areas, y your question is really like, is this our audience? You know, are these the people who identify with essentially the vision of what Billy Graham set forth as, like, CT's evangelical fundamentals. The first episode was about slavery, which is a giant issue, especially if you want to dive deep into the history. I've done a few episodes about it here on Truce, mostly focused on the so-called Curse of Ham. I bring it up a lot. It's actually going to be in another episode in December. Sorry. But to me, it's important. Cue the ominous music. The Curse of Ham is really just a twisted way to read Genesis 9 and the story of Noah. Noah is the guy who built a big boat so that he and all the animals of the world wouldn't die in a flood. He placed a curse on one of his descendants that he'd be the slave of his brothers. This story was taught for years as proof that the African people were supposed to be slaves. It doesn't say that, by the way. I promise. Go read it. This terrible manipulation of Genesis 9 played a really key role in the intersection of Christianity and slavery. So I wanted to know why Richard decided not to talk about the curse of Ham on Living and Effective. Did you guys discuss using that? Uh, was was that in the, on, the, on the table for that show? Yeah, well, the, I mean, you know this, like a lot of the... A lot you do a lot of interviews and like reporting, and then you use maybe like ten percent of it, and so that would have been part of the ninety percent of the interviews that we did. The fundamental question we have to ask we have to answer first is like, does the Bible actually say that slavery is right or wrong? We were focused less on broad racism broadly and more specifically on slavery uh the American chattel slavery we We just stuck with the slavery apologetics basically so um yeah so we I, we didn't use the ham stuff but we definitely it was in our range yeah you have to make editorial decisions it's one of the hardest things about doing this job is you right you have you sometimes get really great tape and you just have to leave it um exactly yeah yeah 
which is hard. In fact, I was wondering um, with the second episode, uh, which is about the Jesus movement, it was very good, especially the connection between the Jesus movement and music. I thought that was really cool. Thanks. Yeah. The Jesus movement, especially like the Jesus people, um, are still around and kind of spun off into this almost cult like thing in Chicago. Um, so I was kind of curious uh, again with that episode. Why why leave that stuff out? Similar thing. I mean, we were focused on, I think, of of time frame and history. And my impression, and and people may disagree with this, I don't know, but my impression is that the real impact of the Jesus People movement, and I'm sure that the Jesus People movement that currently exists might disagree, but the real impact of the Jesus People movement is those people who were saved by, you know, as a result of it, you know, who came to Christ as a result of the sort of discipleship and and mission of the Jesus people movement. And that's really a whole generation of like baby boomers, you know, um, so much of these episodes has been about what to leave out as much as it is, has been about what to leave in. We're about to do an episode on the civil rights movement and we dig pretty deep into Martin Luther King's spiritual journey. We leave out adultery basically completely. <laughs> that's a known problem with him. We just left it out because we couldn't think of, a way to do that that wouldn't overshadow the point we were making. And ultimately, we just found it to be irrelevant to the broader point. Most of us love Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was a great speaker, writer, civil rights activist who also had a dark side. He loved the ladies. They could include that in their story, but would it serve the overall purpose of the piece or distract from it? Sometimes there are so many ways the story can go that the opportunities honestly seem kind of endless. The Jesus People story could have become muddled in questions of the current Jesus People movement, which is, can I say cult? I guess it's kind of cultish. It's, well, it's an organization in Chicago that has also had some dark history with sexual abuse, which completely makes us forget about the positive benefits of the movement as it was in the 70s. That movement, the one back then, had a huge impact on society, on the way we still do church. Whereas the little spin-off cults like the Children of God and the current iteration of Jesus People are blips in comparison. Juicy blips, but blips nonetheless. To me, what's fundamentally more interesting about the Jesus People movement when you compare it to like my youth group experience, which I mention in the show, is that my youth group experience like has some some evangelistic components but i'm not sure i could point to you know giant swaths of people that were impacted by it and in fact quite the opposite you know with the jesus people movement it feels like a whole generation was sort of looped into the church um as a result of that movement i think especially in the christian market and maybe you can speak to this um there is an expectation of positivity I know we saw that when we were making our movies. People want you to be like jumping up and down and happy at the end. And, you know, there were a lot of very specific things um, that had to happen. And I'm not 100% against them, uh, but they were all expected. Uh, Do you feel like there's any of that in the podcasting world, in the Christian world? I'm going to nuance that a little bit. I I would argue, I think negativity is, is at home within Christian the Christian world. I could point to a lot of examples, but like, you know, the clickbait stuff and all the hate uh, watchdog stuff. But even uh, in mainstream, there's a lot of like uh, more political things that tend to get a lot more uh, bitter and angry. The The key is people want to feel, I mean, even if you look at God's Not Dead, right? Like that is a largely negative movie. <laughs> It has a feel-good ending. The reason is, and the thing that all of these have in common is, people like to feel good about themselves, <laughs> you know, not just in general. And I think that is that is a real problem. And that is definitely something we're seeing in the podcast world. You know, there's, um, I tell people there's sort of two kinds of uh, Christian podcasts. There's like sermons, which is fine. Like that makes sense. Um, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but then the other one is just like drunk cussing pastors. I can confirm the drunk pastor podcast is a real thing and I totally don't get it. One of the reasons I love podcasts is because, um, they allow for people to hear out other people with a real investment. Um, and I'm sure you know this, like the reason podcast ads work better, 
uh, than other ads is because people are invested in the thing they're listening to already. And so you've got their ear, you've got their, beyond their ear, you've got their, uh, their listening, you know, and which is a rare thing these days. Um, yeah, that's why I have a Casper mattress and, and use Squarespace. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, we have a Casper mattress and I don't know, we tried Blue Apron a couple of times. <laughs> Really? I, I've done none of that. You should try Blue, Blue Ape and it's free, and it'll just give you like free meals for a little while. If they want to sponsor this show, absolutely. <laughs> I agree with Richard. Podcasting is great because audio works deep into us. We get connected to the stories. Hopefully, it gets us out of our echo chambers and encourages deeper thought. Living and Effective is probably my favorite Christian podcast because... It does choose to walk a line. I can see editorial decisions being made. I love to hear smart, conscious reporting. And to let you in on a secret, I keep hounding him for a job because I'd love to work there. Now that we've discussed Richard's methods, let's talk about my thought process with truce using the same subject matter. There's a concept in storytelling. A way to tell stories so that they're easy to understand. You want to tell them linearly, in a straight line. A leads to B, which leads to C. Try to avoid tangents. That's a good way to tell simple stories, but it sometimes keeps us from getting a 3D picture. Take Willow Creek. It's great to remember their contributions, but not talking about the sin of their leadership steers us clear of the reality that we in Christianity can't ignore sexual misconduct. Not now, not ever. It besmirches the name of Christ. I'm sure that Bill Hybel's sin will be brought up for years to come when we talk about the church. Let's remember that it will also be brought up when non-Christians talk about the Big C Church because of Willow Creek. Catholic scandals, etc. We also as Christians have to be able to forgive each other like Christ forgave us. So it's a tough balance. Maybe that complexity is okay because we keep getting this thing wrong. There's no room for cover-up in the church. In the same way that there's no room for cover-up in my own life. It's a dead giveaway that the curse of Ham is probably going to be in every story I ever do about slavery. It's important to me because it demonstrates the way that we as Christians twist the Bible to fit our agendas. Drilling for oil, environmentalism, health and wealth gospel, we forget that the Bible is meant to work on us, not necessarily for us. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. committed adultery. Christians, Americans, really have a bad habit of worshiping our leaders following them, praising them, to the point that they're no longer people. They're demigods. Dr. King's story illustrates that because we don't want to see him as a man, but as a movement. Not as a sinner like you and me, but as a saint on a stained glass window. I think we want him to be two-dimensional. We set up our leaders to fall, and to fall big and publicly when they're untouchable. Finally, the Jesus people. If I were doing a story about them, which I guess I am right now, I'd have to talk about their behavior in recent years. Because if I do a podcast about the Jesus people and their positive impact, somewhere out there there could be a young person listening who hears the story and Googles them, sees that they're still a thing, and joins. I'll be honest, I'm a nervous guy, and not always to godly ends. And I lay awake questioning the unintended consequences of basically everything. Things I said and did, stuff in the news. I tend to produce stories the same way. The downside of doing stories that are complex, that are non-linear, is that they're harder to follow. But I kind of like them that way. Christianity Today is a great ministry, truly a beacon of hope in a sea of substandard journalism. I'm a subscriber, for goodness sakes. I really respect Richard's choices. The team at Christianity Today has to think about their considerable audience, their schedule, space, and budget. They run a successful media company, and I'm a producer of two minor Christian films, a novel that sold a few dozen copies, And I only have to consider the couple hundred people who download the show. I don't have as much to lose. 
All that to say, journalists, the people we love and hate today, make these decisions all the time. Which is why we need each other's voices, diverse voices. Big companies that start the conversation, that break the news, and little fellows like me who come nipping at their heels. I'll let Richard close with what I think is one of Christianity Today's greatest strengths. The I should say, like, I work here, so I need to make sure that I talk about beautiful orthodoxy, which is like CT's whole cause, right? The, CT's um, core cause right now is this concept that um, we want to communicate the truth in a way that is beautiful, you know? And I think t- too often that gets lost. Too often people choose beauty or truth, but not both. Um, and God is good, beautiful, and true. And so I think I would love to see more podcasts, more media in general, movies, etc., sort of approach um, the truth in that way. I think in Christianity uh, in particular, it leans heavy on the truth side. And that can feel like, you know, something like a clanging gong or cymbal. I think I've heard that somewhere. So, Well, how do you tie the beauty back in then? Good question. To me, it comes down to humanizing what we're talking about. That's just a personal thing. Like, and again, why I love podcasts. You get human beings uh, in the spotlight as opposed to ideas, abstract concepts, then I think even just Jesus humanity, right? Like you start talking about Jesus humanity. You start talking about, I mean, that is why Jesus came to earth. I'm convinced is because when we relate to other human beings on a human level, then that is, um, that starts to, uh, soften our hearts to the truth. And so, well, that's one of the reasons he came, I guess. Um, there are a lot of reasons, (laughs) um, but yeah, I've found over and over again, like you could tweet at someone like crazy. You can convince them of, of all of the right things. But until you look them in the face, uh, then you're not going to, you know, it, you're not going to have the same sort of reaction. Um, and podcasts are sort of a way of like, in a hearing sense, looking someone in the face. You can find Living and Effective at livingandeffective.com. I'm not just saying this because Richard was on my show. It's a really great podcast. I know they want to do a limited run, but I kind of hope they keep it going. It's too good to stop. And of course, thanks to Richard Clark for his time. Truce is a listener-supported show. I just renewed the license for all the music we use on the show, so if anybody would like to help me out, it was $99 for the year. Please subscribe to Truce so that you get every new episode as they're released. It would help a lot if you would leave a review and a rating on your favorite podcasting app. Seriously, go do it. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Special thanks to Nick Steren and Seth Robertson for their comments on this episode. This month, I've been asking listeners to leave a review, tell two friends about Truce, and pray for the podcast. This is a little indie show with only one person as the whole team. I'd appreciate your prayers to keep this thing between the lines, as it were. You can find my movies Bringing Up Bobby and Between the Walls on Amazon Prime and also on Pure Flix. While you're on Amazon, download a copy of my book, Cradle Robber. God willing, we'll be back next week when we start exploring the question, can Christians celebrate Hanukkah? I'm Chris Starin, and this is Truce.